The big question is, as you're thinking about your playing, how do you develop a voice for your instrument? How do you develop a language, or maybe an accent, right? How do you develop that nonverbal communication to be able to communicate to your audience? And that's whether it's recorded or live, right? And how do you develop a voice that is unique to you? What I want you to do is think about that guitarist that you really like and think about what you like about that guitarist. And I am willing to bet that at least part of it is the way that guitarist actually creates the notes on the guitar, right? So the phrasing, the tonality, like the whole picture of what they're playing just speaks to you. And somebody mentioned Alan Holdsworth there. Motosport, and um, he's a great example for me, one of my all-time favorite guitarists, and what I really, I, I love his tone, but what I really love about Alan Holdsworth's music is the phrasing that he uses to achieve his lead lines and his chords. But it's that language that he developed and then used to communicate to us, right? And he told us something that we can't speak in words, but we understand it deeply, right? Because he had a very unique voice on the guitar. I don't want to get too lost on the instruments because once you develop your voice, your musical voice, you will find that it translates to other instruments perhaps besides your main guitar or whatever. Obviously, an instrument has a lot to do with the musical voice. So as we think about it, as you think about it, think about the types of tones that you like, and they can be from your guitar heroes, that's totally cool, and think about the types of guitars they play in, and that's probably the direction you want to be in, whether it's a humbucker single coil, P90 style single coil, whether it's a standard guitar or maybe it's a baritone like I have. Um, they all have unique tonalities to the instrument itself, and that can certainly be the beginning of your voice, right? Because that's going to provide part of the musical color of what you're going to be saying musically. The next thing to think about is the amplifier, or if you're like me, using an amp modeler, but that's kind of the basis of your tone, right? And you want to find a tune that complements the types of music you're going to play, the types of chords you like to play, maybe the types of leads you like to play. You want to find a tone that kind of complements that. The other thing I will say is, as you think about the actual tone coming out of the guitar amplifier, also think about how, as you go from clean to a distorted tone, getting tones that complement each other. They're not going to be exactly alike, but they should complement one another. So there's my clean tone. And if I kind of go for a little bit of crunch or dirt, you'll hear that it's very similar. All right, so it gives me a little extra. But it's still off in the direction of that clean tone. And even when I go into a full lead tone, it's still off in the direction. It's very distorted, but it's off in the tonal direction of even the clean tone. So that gives me a consistent feel kind of across whatever I'm doing. Yeah, it's a nice simple sound, but it kind of fits my vibe, and that's where I want to go next. We are going to get to the hands, right, which are really the most important part, but we do need to talk about effects a little bit as ambient guitarists. My suggestion is don't use more effects than you need to use to achieve the kind of sound you're going for. So really, if you look at that pedal board, it's not that crazy. Um, 
I do have a volume pedal set up also. It's actually an expression pedal plugged into the Iridium, so it acts just like a volume pedal. But really, it's a pretty simple, basic kind of effects chain. But it is very flexible, even with the, you know, kind of the, the delays, the way they're set up now. You can get very nice volume swells. You can still kind of play. So cool, and I won't do the distortion, but it, you know, it sounds really good with distortion too. Only use what you need. Now, how do we start creating a voice that is unique? You know, I think one question or one um, answer to that is not to play the same thing that everybody else plays, but that can be easier said than done, right? Because there are millions of guitarists in the world. But I think maybe another way to think about it is to, to think about how you can give each note that you play some meaning. So let's just say I'm playing, uh, this is by the way, a G sharp minor on the baritone to an F sharp major. Okay, so let's just say I'm playing these chords. All right, you know, and, and that's cool, but everybody can play that, right? Uh, even guitarists who've only been playing for a few months, once they learn a bar chord, they can play that, and the strumming is, you know, pretty straightforward. And I would say that I have not given all the notes that I just played meaning. So the way I would think about that, those two chords is maybe something more along these lines, having the same kind of rhythm. All right, so I cut almost all the notes out but the notes that I had left, I could concentrate on a little bit more. Let me slow that down a little bit. So I'm gonna stay on those same two kind of, the same kind of chord progression. Okay, so if I was playing the whole chords. What I'm attempting to do is making space again for the notes, but also creating a kind of variety between notes that sustain and notes that I'm not letting sustain. And that's another technique to think about using. And you don't have to do it just like I'm doing it here, right? You may not be, you know, hybrid picking. You might have a totally different tonality. But again, you're kind of paying attention to the notes you're playing and trying to give each one some meaning as you play it. One of the big things to think about also with your favorite players is, what kind of movement are they injecting into each note that they play, right? So these notes are not just bare notes. Your favorite player does something special with each note. 
So on that, on that note there, I'm actually using the fingernail of my right ring finger to create a more kind of wispy sound on that note. And that's actually a technique that I use a lot for quieter, more clean pieces. So that's, there are techniques that your favorite players have like that, that they're using to create movement or textures or tonality to the notes that they play. So I would also suggest maybe looking for techniques that you enjoy playing that can help you provide variation in the tonality of the notes. Um, you can use these techniques of kind of playing less notes and trying to emphasize the notes, whether you're playing clean or whether you're playing with, you know, a little bit of dirt or crunch. Now, the thing you'll notice is because of the distortion, notes, notes tend to blend together more easily and become less distinct. So as you move up in the gain, you're going to have to learn how to deal with keeping the notes distinct. That still sounds pretty good, but if I go full distortion with what I just did, it's going to be fairly muddy. And, you know, that's not bad, but as I think about playing there, I'm going to want to control the notes more to allow them to ring out clear. As you can hear, I, I didn't allow notes to ring too much, a little bit, but not too much, because I wanted to make sure that I was maintaining clarity with all of that gain, right? Otherwise, it's just kind of a mess. One technique I use a lot is actually stopping the strings by palm muting, or um, since I do a lot of hybrid picking, my ring, uh, my middle finger and ring finger and pinky finger are usually available, and I actually use them to stop strings also so that I can just focus on the strings that I want to sound out when I'm playing leads. So let, let me show you what I mean. Just kind of watch my hand here. <laughs> I'm trying to maintain control of which strings are ringing at all times to make sure that only the ones I want to ring are actually producing sound. Hopefully that makes sense. This does lead into another tip to think about, and that is the type of pick that you're using or your fingers. That's going to make a big difference in the tonality of your playing, right, which is going to affect your musical voice. So I, I like to use picks that are pretty thick. This is a two and a half millimeter uh, jazz pick that I, I really like on the baritone and I even use it on regular guitars. The reason why I like it is because I do use my fingers and my pick together and I think it give, I feel like it gives me a consistent tone between the pick and the fingers. Yeah, blends together really nicely, and even with a distorted tone. I can really kind of blend them together. 
So that works for me. And I have spoken with a number of people who do not prefer very thick picks. As a matter of fact, one of my best musical buddy friends, really, he likes basically a Fender medium, which I think is like, I don't know, 0.6 or 0.7 millimeters. It's not even a one millimeter pick. And I got to admit, he plays some pretty fabulous guitar. So what works for him and what works for me are two different things. But it is important to think about that pick and how it affects your tonality. Um, one of my loves, music loves, is bluegrass. And one of my early influences guitar-wise is Norman Blake, who is a fabulous uh, bluegrass flat picker. So when I was a teenager, I learned how to flat pick. I could do better on an acoustic guitar, but hopefully you get the you get the point, right? I'm using flat picking techniques for something that is not bluegrass. never know what you know what you're going to come up with but it will be interesting and it may very well be something that you can leverage to build a truly unique voice as you think about vibrato there's really three different ways that you can move the string to create a vibrato effect Obviously, you can move the string across the fingerboard, in other words, in line with the fret, right? And that's pretty common in rock music. You can use a more classical guitar kind of type of vibrato, or maybe violin, right? And that's going to be a little more subtle because you're not kind of doing mini bends on the strings. But there is a third way that's even more subtle that I use quite a bit. You may or may not be able to see it as I play, but it's actually pressing the string into the fingerboard and then lightening the touch on the string. So I, I actually do that quite a bit. Um, it's not, I'm exaggerating it here just so you can kind of see it. But what that does is it creates a little micro bend in the pitch of the string as you push down on it. And you can use it to create uh, very subtle movements in the string that are almost like a, it's a vibrato for sure because the pitch is changing, but it can create very subtle chorusing effect. So I, it's hard for me to demonstrate it because as I'm thinking about it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it way too obviously. Think about vibrato and how you're using it to add, I, I like to think of it as an accent to your notes, right? In your language, in your musical language. <laughs> I would say, especially for lead, almost every note I play has some kind of movement to it. I very rarely just play straight notes with no pitch movement. Don't be afraid to use vibrato on your chords. That, 
that's a really cool technique that's well worth kind of figuring out how to do well. Yeah, it's really nice. A couple of other things, though, that are related are the use of hammer-on and pull-offs. That can really bring a lot of variety um, as you're playing either chords or, uh, or leads because a pulled off or hammered on string sounds different than a pick string. Okay. And it does get very interesting when you're playing lead. You, you don't have to pick every note. I think it's well worth practicing if you dial up a lead tone. Just play lead lines and don't use a pick at all. You, you can use your right hand to mute the strings so you don't end up with a muddy mess. One of the other things I think that's related are bending strings, right? So we can do those typical, you know, kind of bends, but you can use them in a very subtle way too. One of the thing I one of the things I like to do sometimes is I'll bend before I play the note so I can do a down bend. You know, I can do the up bend, but I can also do a down bend. And I can also bend in to another note. Another thing to think about as you're building your musical voice is looking for unique chord voicings. And I, I'm, I'm saying that carefully because I don't think that I really do anything unique um, with any one single chord, right? So if I was playing a standard guitar, that would be, that would be uh, kind of a, a C with an add nine, right? Um, but that, you know, with that shape, that's not unique, right? I didn't invent that. But, you know, if I combine it with some other things that are maybe a little less common, maybe the minor seventh interval, with a higher gain tone, there's a lot of interesting things that come out as you pick the strings. So let me show you what I mean. Oh, uh, that was interesting, wasn't it? Isn't that interesting? So you hear the harmonic series kind of shifting as I hit the string, and that that was not a pinch harmonic. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I I actually played that string with my ring finger and used a little bit more of the nail and caught the string on the edge of the nail. So 
it allows the string to start out in a high gain situation with the kind of the more fundamental, but as it rings, you can hear the harmonic series shifting that's being emphasized, which is a re it's really cool. But again, that can provide a really interesting um, coloration to the note that you're playing. Don't forget about the controls on your guitar. There is a move, uh, there, and there has been, to simplify controls on the guitar in, the, in an effort to get a, quote, pure sound from the guitar to the amp. I respect that, but I couldn't live without my tone control. I also really, really enjoy having a volume control so that I can vary the volume, the gain coming into the pedals. You know, now, that didn't get rid of a lot of the distortion, but it definitely reduced the gain. And if I just use a slightly crunchy tone, You guys know this trick, right? You back off the volume control and and the tone and the the sound cleans up, right? The tone of the guitar cleans up, right? And of course, you can you can also control that by picking softer or harder. So don't forget that either. I forgot to mention that earlier. But the tone control in particular is where I really vary a lot. I very rarely turn my tone control all the way up. I usually keep it about three or four. And if I'm playing lead, I turn it all the way down. I find it gives me a much smoother tone, which I really like. I, I realize not everyone likes it, but I like it. So it, it is a difference. L I'll, let me turn the tone control up and you'll hear it. So let me, let me play a couple of other things here and look at some of the techniques I'm using as I play. Did you catch some of those techniques that I talked about? There was a bunch of them in there, right? Pull-offs, hammer-ons, vibrato, bends, the picking with fingers and pick for different textures, um, etc. So, yeah, I try to live by some of those some of those techniques I I told you about, you know, through this live stream. Mm -hmm. 